concrete. Handled correctly, it combines versatility and durability better than any other building material we have discovered, at least in the last 3,000 years. And with all of today's user-friendly products, mixing, pouring, and finishing your own concrete has become easier than ever. It really is almost as simple as just add water. Because there is no substitute for seeing with your own eyes, we have focused the live action in this video on the concrete itself. How should it look when it is mixed correctly? How can you tell when the wet concrete surface is ready for troweling? What should you expect to find when the concrete forms are finally stripped off? At the end of this DVD program, you'll get a brief look past the basics and into the expanding world of decorative concrete. You'll see some of the many unique and creative ways you can apply your new concrete skills around your home. And we think you'll agree that in addition to its durability and versatility, concrete can be beautiful. I'm Mark Johansson on behalf of Creative Publishing International and Black & Decker. Thank you for purchasing this copy of The Complete Guide to Masonry and Stonework. As a special thank you for uh, purchasing this book, we've included a bonus DVD where we're able to show you in real time some of the, the ways that you work with masonry. And to help us out with that is Chris Becker of Becker Architectural Concrete of Woodbury, Minnesota. Chris has an extensive background in concrete and is a great technician working with the material as well as a great visionary for what concrete can do and how it can be used inside the home. So I think it's going to be a great, uh, great introduction into the world of concrete. Obviously I love concrete and I've built a business around it, so uh, today what we really want to focus on is just uh, talking about the material. Although it is a fairly simple material, there's some complex characteristics to it that we want to make sure everybody really understands when they're working with the product. Uh, variables as conditions, weather, sunlight can all affect the product. So what we're going to do today is just start off by showing how the concrete material is mixed. Um, we're going to set up a small slab and we're going to show just the basics of doing your own slab for your backyard. It might be for a shed, it might be for an air conditioner pad or a grill. Um, again, showing the basic building block techniques of pouring, screeding, finishing the concrete. And then we'll have a little bit of fun and actually show you some of the things we do where you can put some color and texture into the surface. Great. And you've worked with a lot of do-it-yourselfers in the past, so you know exactly where they make those mistakes and things that they should, should avoid. Yeah, we really want to make sure that people understand just what they're getting into before they start a project. Once that concrete starts setting, uh, there's no turning back. So we want to make sure that people understand what their capabilities are and it's not a bad idea to have a few friends around. Exactly. We're going to talk now about the basic ingredients that are concrete. Um, it's really pretty simple. Portland cement, sand, and aggregate. Add a little water mixed together, it's concrete. Any concrete you buy in a bag in a store is going to have basically this stuff in it. All it really differs is, is the ratios. And Chris, maybe you can tell us a little bit about why some has more than others and, and what, if anything, we really need to know about it. Well, a lot of people just kind of view concrete as just a really kind of a one-dimensional material. There are thousands of different types of mix designs. And mm -hmm. uh, as you get into more foundational uh, concrete that you might use for a footing or a wall, um, you'll see that the aggregate um, is larger. That okay. creates a, uh, a stronger interlock of the concrete. Um, really it's a combination of this Portland cement which is ground limestone um, that when it reacts with water it starts to hydrate, it starts to okay. change. Um, it goes from this liquid to a solid. Uh, so all the, the variations in the blending of these materials um, have different characteristics. Slabs for example will have a slightly smaller aggregate and a little bit more sand so it's easier to finish. Okay. Um, some of the specialty applications like we do with sinks and countertops may not have any aggregate in it. So really, um, for a do-it-yourself project, um, buying a material that's pre-mixed um, that tells you what it's for um, can be the easiest way to get started right. in this process. Right, so you wouldn't necessarily recommend that I go out and order two truckloads of, of limestone and two truckloads of sand and some aggregate and mix it all together in my driveway and, and save a couple of bucks. Yeah, in the end you won't save any money and uh, you'll be very frustrated. So okay, um, sounds that way. it's much more economical to buy it pre-mixed. So there are basically two ways that you can go to acquire concrete. You can uh, order it in as a ready mix or you can mix your own. Um, if you order ready mix from the truck, you just tell them what your project is and they'll send you the right stuff. Trust them to do it for you. They're, they're good at that. If you're mixing your own, you'll find you have a lot of options. Um, and basically it all comes down to reading a bag. Um, but the, as we saw in an earlier demonstration, the, the ingredients are basically the same from concrete to concrete, but the individual products are, differ sometimes quite a bit. Well, there's some 
Some basic groupings. Um, the bag that we have here is just a good all-around concrete mix uh, for the project that uh, we're working on today. This is the kind of material that is going to be sufficient for slabs, um, for steps, for any kind of basic outdoor project. As you work your way up, there are some products that have a higher strength characteristic. This material will get up to 5,000 PSI, which is quite strong and, and more than you would typically need for any durability factor, but mm -hmm. if you just want something that you feel a little bit more confident in terms of the compressive strength, um, anything that says high strength or 5,000 PSI mix would be that next step up. And, and for comparison, something like this will be in the 3,000 PSI range, is that right? Three to yeah. 3,500, 3, right. yep. Great. Sand mix, this is just a, a mix that doesn't actually have any aggregate in it, so if you're uh, doing something that's perhaps a little bit more sculptural or something that has a little bit more detail to it, making a casting of some sort, um, a sand mix will do well. This would not work for any kind of a slab. Um, it would crack. Um, it needs that aggregate in there for the strength. We've got a couple of other specialty products down here for making um, concrete countertops, concrete castings. Um, this is a particular material that is used to actually dry pack into a mold um, that you come back and do some interesting filling and polishing with that actually will make the surface look like stone. Um, this is a very specialty concrete countertop material. Um, this is another one that's available which um, is very self-consolidating. So you can pour this into a mold and pop the mold out the next day and have almost a perfect casting. Um, no rock in this one as, as well, but it has a lot of admixtures and ingredients and fibers that make it um, very strong without those, um, without those pieces of rock in them. If you're looking to have something that gets hard within an hour, um, there's mm -hmm. fast setting products. Um, there's uh, concrete bags specifically for post footings. Um, there's self-leveling materials if you're trying to level out an uneven slab. Um, and there's lots of repair materials. Sure. Um, so they're all well marked and have fairly good instructions. If you have any questions, the associate at the building center should be able to help you. Okay, very good. Well, Chris and I are going to take a minute right now to talk about masonry finishing tools, the tools that you use to get a nice surface and profile onto the product after it's put into the forms. You've got three basic types, floats, trowels, and edger profile tools. Um, Chris, why don't you tell us a little bit about them? Thanks. Yeah, this is the, the real building blocks of finishing concrete slabs. And when you're doing your own do-it-yourself project, um, you can go to a rental store and mm -hmm. you'll find uh, that many of these tools are available as a kit for finishing your slabs. So okay, this is a magnesium float. And this is one of the kind of building block uh, finishing tools that's used early on um, to do detailing work along the edges of the forms. Um, it's a tool that will flatten the concrete out, but it won't seal it. And it's very important to understand that we don't want to try to seal the surface too tight early on. And the magnesium is the surface here? So right. Okay. And um, again, this is a, a, a finisher's best friend. So that's um, used early on in the process. Um, and why magnesium? Is that different? There, I know there are also wood floats and steel floats. Is, does the magnesium impart a different kind of a look on it? Or? Yeah, the magnesium is just not quite as honed and dense as a, as a steel trawl that we'll talk about and uh, um, it just does a nice job of closing the surface up without sealing it. A wood float is also a good tool. It's a little bit more fibrous. It'll bring more um, cream and moisture up to the surface. The next tool that we'll use is called a bull float and uh, this is a four foot float. They come in larger sizes for bigger projects but this is mm -hmm. a standard size. You can see that there's a snap-on um, head here where you can extend um, your handles out from you know typically four all the way up to 12, 14 feet. Okay. Um, this tool has a swivel head so as you're pushing the concrete out across the slab you can tilt it slightly and it'll right across the surface and then when you get to the end you can tilt it back and it'll raise the back edge when you're pulling. And that'll help again smooth the surface out. We're trying to get all of the imperfections of the screening process out and get the surface nice and flat. Okay, and it's also moving some of the concrete around in the process, or is it should all be pretty well in place by then? Yeah, at this point you don't really want to use this to take concrete from point A to point B. We're just trying to, again, get the surface nice and flat. Okay, and these also I know are available as rental items too, so you Absolutely. don't have to... After the surface is bowl floated, uh, the next step would be to go along the forms and edge each okay. side of the slab. And the reason that we do that is we don't want to leave a sharp 90 degree angle on the slab. It's weak, it could mm -hmm. chip off. Um, so we typically use what's called a uh, edger. Okay. Um, this particular edger has a 3 8 inch radius. We just put the tool down and work it along the edge and just create a nice rounded radius along the form. Okay, lifting the top up as you move in exactly. whatever direction. Okay. What's most important is that you're not uh, 
pulling off to this side or gouging in here, that's when you'll create a dip in the, in the actual surface of the concrete. So typically you'll put your hand here just to create a nice flat spot and then just pull the trowel. Okay, and that 3 8 inch uh, profile, is that for sidewalks, slabs, you know, any kind of poured concrete slab, or do you, do you like with stair nosing use a, a, a bigger, rounder profile? Um, pretty much this is for slabs only. When you're doing stairs, you can get into some, some larger radiuses, some half inch and 5 8 inch radiuses. So after the edging is done, uh, the concrete now is starting to set up. And if you're going to take the slab from a progression of um, initial smoothing, the next step would be um, what we in the industry call a heifer float. Okay. Um, bull float, heifer float. So we're talking in animal language, but this is a smaller tool, um, still magnesium, lighter. It'll just take out more of the fine imperfections, some of the lines that are left by this bull float. Now, if you were inclined to skip one step in the process, is that perhaps the one you might be able to get away with? Absolutely, okay. yeah. You can, in many cases, go from a bull float even right to a broom finish. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on just how flat, smooth, and dense you want the surface. So when you're really trying for a nice smooth surface, then you're gonna break out these guys, which are the steel trowels. And you can see that it's a, it's a very tough, dense surface. Um, this is at the point where the concrete, you could actually almost walk on it and not sink in very far. Mm -hmm. So there's different sizes of these tools. Um, these rounded, what are called pool trowels, are very nice because as you're trawling over the surface, there's not a sharp edge right. like this one, which may leave some lines. So as a, as a beginner tool, this is a very nice one, and we use it on a lot of our surfaces as well. And it's okay to be down on your hands and knees working on the, the surface at this point? Yeah, if you are doing a garage slab or anything that's non-exterior, um, shooting for that smooth surface, this is the direction mm -hmm. you're going to be going. You're going to be working off of either a piece of styrofoam or a knee pad that you're kneeling on okay. while you're doing the trawling process. And then uh, this little guy is called the burner. This is an eight inch steel trawl um, where you can put a tremendous amount of force down on a small area mm -hmm. and actually work the surface where you'll create almost some black marks in it. And that creates almost a polished looking concrete. And, and a burnished finish is going to be easier to clean. Is it also more stain resistant? Are there other qualities that are make it desirable? Yeah, it's a lot more dense surface. So mm -hmm. uh, stains won't penetrate as much provided you're still putting a good sealer on the surface. Uh, just smoother, easier to clean. Um, if we're back out to our outside conditions, um, this is a, a groover, and this is a tool that actually puts a joint in the concrete. Mm -hmm. And the idea behind this is that all concrete shrinks as it cures. It goes from a liquid to a solid and it becomes smaller, and as that process occurs, the concrete will generally crack. Mm -hmm. So we understand that um, you'd want to have these um, joints in the slab about every 8 to 10 feet. Um, so this tool is used to separate the aggregate. Um, we'll typically take a straight edge and we'll lay it out on the slab and then we'll run this tool to create a nice straight line. So this will allow the concrete to crack where we want it to. Okay, and at what point in the drying process is that after the bleed water is up that you would normally go in and... Right, this would be done after the floating process okay. um, and just prior to the brooming process. Okay. The most standard non-slip finish is called a broom finish. Right. And this is just a concrete finishing broom. Um, it has a fairly flexible bristle, and the idea behind this is that you're going to take this and put it on the surface again. Once the surface is uniformly set and not too wet, you'll take it out and go as far as you can to the edge of the slab. Let it set down gently and keep the angle of the handle consistent and just slowly pull it across the surface. Okay. And if the concrete is set at the right consistency, that'll just produce a nice broom finish. But very shallow, right? It's not, it doesn't really furrow it. It's just a very right. minimal texture. Yeah, you wouldn't want to put this on too early where the concrete was very wet. You'd create a very rough, unattractive surface. Right. So this is really just at the very end of the project. Okay. This is a specialty tool used for steps. Once you've got the concrete set up enough where you can pull your riser forms off, this right. is a tool that comes in and basically finishes that inside cove. Okay. So it's, it's going to be working not only the, the tread, but also the face. Okay, so specifically for stairs, which is a relatively tricky DIY um, concrete pouring project. Right. We suggest that you have a friend that knows a little bit about concrete if you're going to try to attempt that. Right. I can vouch for that. Yeah. yeah. So we've talked a little bit about concrete, and now we're going to actually mix them up. The way most people do it when they're first learning how to, to mix concrete is by hand in a wheelbarrow or a mortar box. Uh, we're going to demonstrate that now. But before we do, we need to take a minute and talk a little bit about some of the safety precautions when you're working with dry concrete mix. It looks pretty innocuous, but the stuff can actually be pretty 
pretty toxic in some cases. And, and Chris, why don't you tell us a little bit about some of the dangers of working with concrete and what you can do to protect yourself? Well, first of all, don't underestimate, even if it's a small project, that uh, you can get away without using any kind of safety equipment. So a good pair of gloves is going to be really vital uh, to make sure that any incidental contact from the actual concrete and the cement doesn't get on your skin. If you don't work with this product regularly, your skin could be very sensitive and you could actually get cement burns where the material actually will start to eat so, away at your skin. So even if you're tooling with wet concrete with an edger or something, you still want to wear gloves at that point? Yeah, it's just a good idea to keep your gloves on the whole time that you're working with the material. You never know where you might get a little bit right. splashed on it, might accidentally put your hand in the concrete, and if you're busy and preoccupied, you may not think to wash your hand off right away. So okay. it's important to just keep the gloves on the whole time. Along with the hand protection, you, you also want some kind of lung protection, particularly when the concrete's in dry form. I've seen particle masks. That's not good enough for most cases. Is that right? You know, for just a one-time exposure, it's going to really trap most of uh, what you'd need to be concerned okay. about. Uh, you know, since we work with the product every day, we've felt a lot more comfortable using an actual respirator. Okay. Uh, this is something that we can change out the filters on, and uh, just everyday prolonged exposure to this material um, can create problems, silicosis, um, just other lung problems. Okay, and then as always, some kind of eye protection is always a good idea. Absolutely, okay. especially when you're mixing the concrete, there's a chance it might splash, mm -hmm. um, get a little bit of that in your eye, and it can be just awful. So you want to make sure you have your glasses on, particularly when you're mixing. All right, so you put the recommended amount of water into your dry concrete mix, mixed it in real well. Looks like we might still be a little stiff with our mixture, is that right? Yeah, you know, as you work with concrete, you understand that it's really not an exact science. So um, in this case, you know, we're going to be working with this for a slab. So we want it just a little bit looser. Um, if we were working with a, a footing or a post fold, anything like that, uh, this would be just fine. And is there a way to, to test, like taking a handful or something, you know where it's, where it's ready? or? Yeah, you generally want to make sure that it's... Um, easy to just grab. Uh, you can see in this case, you know, it's still pretty, doesn't really want to make a ball real well. It's still fairly dry. Okay. Kind of wants to fall apart. So we want to get it to more of like a pancake batter consistency. You know, the less water in there, the stronger the concrete is. But if it's not workable, then it really doesn't matter. So you can see here that the uh, the concrete is really now it's a lot it's a lot more fluid, but it's not runny. So you can make a nice ball with it, much like it would be in the mm -hmm. form. You can see now that we have something nice to work with. Okay. So if you take nothing else away from all the information we've learned here, this is what concrete is supposed to look like when you put it in the ground. I think that's a great lesson. Absolutely. So we've talked a little bit about how we're going to mix the concrete for different formulations and things, and now we're going to de demonstrate how you pour a basic concrete slab. Obviously, this is a little bit smaller than you'd likely pour if you're doing a patio or something like that, but for our purposes, I think it's going to, going to show pretty well the basic steps. Well, the start of any good concrete slab project is the soil preparation and the base. So what we have here is two inches of a limestone uh, aggregate. Okay, like class five kind of thing? Correct, okay. yeah. And we typically like to put that down and compact it. Um, that facilitates good drainage underneath the slab and also makes a uniform base so if the slab is moving from frost up and down it's doing it um, as one cohesive unit. So that's the, the basic class 5 foundation you do that obviously before you put the forms on or anything like that and any other kind of surface preparation that's kind of where the engineer starts getting involved right if you've got sandy soil or clay soil or right if there's if there's some really heavy soils where you're working you may need to take out more than just that two inches um, in some cases, there's a drain tile element that would be a part of um, getting water away from the area that the slab is. Uh, but once that, once that base is down and compacted, then we set our forms and we've used just a standard two by four okay. uh, dimensional lumber, lumber here. We typically use eight to 10 foot okay. forms. You get anything longer, they're a little bit uh, not as straight. So um, these are easy to work with. And, okay. and they uh, don't need to be pressure treated or anything like that, just no. plain old construction grade. Right, okay. right.
And a two by four is perfect for a slab that's gonna give you that three and a half inch thick slab, which is right in the range of where you wanna be, right? Yeah, American Concrete Institute suggests a three and a half to four inch slab for okay. any non-vehicular application. So patios, pool decks, walkways, mm -hmm. all of those can be at this thickness. If you're pouring a driveway or anything where there's gonna be heavy weight on it, um, suggest a minimum of five to six inches. Great, and then you just screw them together on the corners with deck screws and that's... Right, some guys like to use a duplex nail. We like okay. to use screws. Mm -hmm. um, again, you can see that there are some stakes uh, supporting the forms, um, which is very important to make sure that the right. forms don't separate during the pouring process. Okay. And it's also important, I think, to screw through the stake into the form, correct? That is correct. You want those to be held together and make sure that the level of the stake is below the top of the form. Right. That won't uh, get in the way of the screening process. Right, and then when you strip the forms off, you can just take, disconnect them from the stake and pop it out. Pop right? them right out, okay. yep. And if you clean them off uh, right away, then you can reuse them for your next job. Okay, great. Now, being a professional, you, uh, you, you folks often use uh, like aluminum forms and some more sophisticated forming technology, don't you? Right, so, and okay. especially when we're doing any kind of curved shapes, we have some plastic forms that are uh, very easy to bend. They hold their shape nicely. Okay, but if it's a homeowner, if you wanted to do a little you know, curved corner or something on that, what kind of a material would you use for that? You could usually get some uh, masonite, um, okay. and you can cut that down to a four inch thickness, and you could actually go in and create a radius just inside of that box. Um, sometimes we'll even use uh, lap siding. We'll rip that down into a four inch height and then use that to create a curve. If it's not a real dramatic curve, you can even use a one by material. Mm -hmm. Once the uh, base is down, once we have our forms in place, then um, we put in our reinforcing. And there's several different options for reinforcing. Okay. Um, within uh, what a professional would typically do, um, he may be using um, reinforcing steel, rebar. This is wel welded wire fabric, which uh, is readily available at most building centers. Okay. The goal with this material is to try to get it in the bottom third to the mid section of the slab. Okay. So we have it seated up on just some pieces of cinder block here, and that'll prevent the wire mesh from actually gravitating down towards the bottom of the slab when you're pouring the concrete. It's more important isn't it, on a larger pour maybe where you'll be walking on it and you have to keep it from sliding around, moving around. Is that Right. In it, which case you have a, a bolster or a chair where you can actually lash it with tie wire and, and hold it down. Absolutely, okay. and you'll see that on a lot of commercial floors as well as any kind of commercial paving you might see on the highway. Those uh, pieces of steel are supported by a, by a chair. Okay, so that's the reinforcement. And do you have a preference yourself if, if you use rebar or remesh? Uh, does it does it really make a difference? Is one easier to work with or cheaper? The wire mesh is really a, a, a good material to use if you're a do-it-yourselfer. Mm -hmm. um, it's easier to handle and cut. Um, what it's doing is helping hold the slab together, um, specifically where you might have a joint in the slab. If there's any kind of movement, okay. the mesh holds it together. Uh, the rebar does the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. It just has a little bit more of a structural um, quality to it. Okay. So when we're doing driveways, uh, we tend to like to use um, a half inch rebar. You can see here that we've held the mesh back away from the sides of the forms, typically three to four inches. So you don't have to worry about it protruding through the, the side of the form after that uh, is pulled off. Okay, so that pretty well covers the preparation we need to do with our forms. Is there anything else we need to do to get ready before the big pour? Well, the next step would be to spray a release on the forms. And what that's going to do is prevent the concrete from sticking to the wood and creating problems when you're pulling the forms off after the concrete is set up. And if you're a homeowner and you don't happen to have a, a high pressure pump like that with a professional release agent, just a paintbrush and some vegetable oil, right? Paintbrush will do the job. Okay. Well, as we said, one of the options for mixing concrete is to make your own with pre-bagged concrete mix. And the great thing about this is it just comes in a dry mix, only add water and you're ready to go. Um, it comes in 60 or 80 pound bags. As you can see, we've got some 80 pounds here and we've got a, a power concrete mixer to mix it up in. Is that something you would recommend people using or at what point do you break away from just using a masonry hoe on a box? Depends on uh, how big the project is and how much help you have. but. Uh a unit like this will go a long way if you're trying to do something that's you know more than 15 or 20 bags. That's where it's really going to pay off in spades to uh, get the material mixed up efficiently and get it down on the ground. You don't have a whole lot of time. And what's the capacity of this particular unit now, this gas-powered one? About two cubic feet, two so cubic you can feet. get about two to three bags in there and mix that up efficiently. If concrete work is something you're going to do regularly, this is a really good investment in terms of helping you out and be more efficient. Um, if it's just an occasional kind of project, uh, I would definitely look at renting one of these. Okay. Great. So we're going to get at it now. We've got basically concrete and water. I know Ryan's going to come in here and give us a hand and uh, do the actual hard work for us. 
So it's really important to make sure that you add the water first uh, instead of putting the material in and then trying to add water on top of that. It will not mix quite as well. So we're going to start off by just adding one bag at a time here. So what you want to look for in the mixer is a nice cohesive blend of the materials. You don't want to see any dry pockets, uh, materials stuck to the sides that might fall down into the mix. So it should really look like a nice stiff batch of pancake batter. I can really see why it's important to wear that respirator. Better than even a particle mask. A respirator is going to really trap a lot more of the, the dust and the silica which gets airborne, which if you breathe that repeatedly can be damaging to your lungs. I see he's got eye protection too, also not a bad idea. Yeah, absolutely. You never know when you might get a little splash coming out of the mixer, so uh, overindulgence in safety is, is better than, than not. So you can see that the consistency of the material here is cohesive. It, it holds together, it holds its shape, but it's not too stiff. Um, if you see dry clumps of material that have either collected on the mixer or in the material that you're unloading, that's the sign that you need to back up and remix for a few minutes. And I see you've got in a pretty big blob here. Basically the goal is to, to move it as little as possible, isn't that right? Yeah, you should get your concrete as close to the final point of its placement as possible. It's not a good idea to try to place it in one corner and drag it across. That's when you'll have issues with aggregate segregation and problems with the material. So the next thing we're going to do is going to take a concrete rake and we're going to try to level this concrete out as much as possible before we begin to screed it. Okay. So the yeah. idea here is just to use the screed board, the edge of the boards as a guide okay. and then just consolidate the material as flat as possible. So you're using a specialized concrete rake here if you don't have access to those, will a garden rake turned upside down do the job? Absolutely. The whole idea is that you've just got something to pull the concrete fairly flat. Well, we've placed all our concrete, looks like you've got right, about the right amount in there and you've worked a little bit, raked it, and uh, now it's time to strike it off. And to do that, you use a tool called a screed. Uh, you see you've got an aluminum one here. You can use a 2x4 if you, if you don't have an aluminum one, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, a nice straight 2x4 will work just fine. Uh, we typically like to use an aluminum board. It holds its shape over a long period of time. And uh, the whole goal here is to get this concrete as level as possible with the forms. So as you'll see here, what we're going to do is um, I uh, have two people working this. Ryan's going to come in and we're going to uh, take the screed board and kind of emulate a seesawing action. And what that's going to do is it's going to close the surface of the concrete up and level it at the same time. Um, smaller jobs, you can certainly take a smaller screed board and do it yourself. Uh, and in this application, we're just going to show how two people would work together. So you can see now that we've screeded out about two feet of the slab and, and you can notice there's a depression here. Sure. Um, that's a low spot. That's where the concrete wasn't quite up to the level of the forms that we wanted. So what we'll typically do is just take our float, mm -hmm. we'll grab a little bit of concrete from the back and we'll just sprinkle it over the top. You can pat it down. At that point it looks like it's, it's pretty well covered in. So now we'll pick up the screed board and we'll start over and just go over that spot again. So you're not trying to get a finished surface here, you're just preparing it for the, the later tooling that will happen? Yeah, there'll be other um, steps that we're going to take where we're going to be floating and smoothing the concrete. So again, to make uh, the most efficient um, work process, we're just trying to get it as flat as possible. This is tough to get perfect, so you just want to make sure that you're not trying to scrape down too close and end up with a low spot. Again, that could create problems in terms of drainage or just the, the appearance of the slab. So if you've got a little bit left over at the end of the, the screening process and it goes over to the side of the form, that's fine. So you can see in this corner where it's dipped down just a little bit um, along this edge also, it's just a little bit low. So some of the next steps that we're going to be doing are going to be floating 
and edging the surface and that will compress the material a little bit. So at this stage if you have just a little bit of material in these corners uh, that's above the slab that's that's totally fine. So we'll grab some more concrete out of the wheelbarrow and start to hand float the edges. Again not worrying about being perfect but just making sure we're not low anywhere. And we're in good shape. All right, so if you get your low ends all filled in, you've got a nice layer crowning cr concrete on the top here, and I'm starting to see some water coming up. Is that typical? Yeah, this is a uh, phenomenon called bleed water, and okay. it's the extra moisture that isn't needed um, for the um, actual hydration of the, the concrete below that typically rises to the surface. At this point, you want to just leave it alone, let this moisture uh, evaporate off the surface. Okay. Um, if you try to come in and work this back into the concrete, um, you're going to start to weaken this top layer. Um, which could create some problems down the road. Okay. So the, the length of time the bleed water is on is going to vary with the weather, right? So. Yeah, that's correct. And so the thing you want to look for is um, a reduction of this glistening uh, on the surface. So when the concrete okay. starts to look like it's actually becoming dry, that's when we know that the bleed water has evaporated and it's time to start the floating process. Okay. All right, well our bleed water has finally come up off the concrete and we're ready for the next step, which is called the bull float. It's not something you need to do with every you know, concrete pour. It's a typically larger slabs, this, which this isn't one. We're just kind of showing you right now how it does, how you do it if, you're if your slab is say 10 feet by 10 feet or, or larger. You want to be able to test the slab and if you can just kind of press down on it and it's not going to sink in too much, just leaves a little bit of uh, fingertip prints then you know that the slab is hard enough to put this tool on top of it okay. without worrying about it sinking in or creating any kind of divots. So the first rule is to make sure that the direction that you initially start running the bull float is perpendicular to the screeding uh, process. So as you Which remember... Which was this way for us. Right. So we're going to run this thing perpendicular. You're just going to set the tool down just on the edge. Work it across. And then when you get to the edge, gently set it down. You want to tilt it ever so slightly. And how do you tilt it? By turning the, the handle on the bull float. Okay. You can see that with the pivot head here, it's just brought up the back end of the bull float. It's very yeah. important to not take the bull float and just set it right down on the edge. The weight of the tool may end up um, causing the edge to settle. Mm -hmm. And conversely, when you're going to the far side of the slab, you don't want to pivot or tilt the uh, bull float too close to the edge. Again, you want to stay back just a little bit. If you're pretty good at it, you won't leave any lines from the tool. So this concrete is behaving very nicely. It's closing up nicely. And you can see now we've taken out some of the lines from the screening process. Mm -hmm. That's right. And now we're going to run the uh, bull float um, the same direction that we originally screeded the slab. This will be the last pass with the tool. Again, just with a slight angle on the front edge of the bull float. And now we'll bring it back. And I have a little imperfection just right about here where I'm coming at the float. So I'm going to push down on the handle a little bit. And I'm going to try to flatten that out. I'm going to go back one more time. So when you see an area that looks a little bit uneven, you can put some pressure down on the handle, which is going to put more weight on the actual head of the tool. But as usual, you want to avoid overworking it. Right. So we're at a point now where this slab is ready to receive the rounded edges prior to uh, the final finishing steps. The next step is edging the slab. And this is important because it gives the, um, the edge of the slab a nice radius, which will prevent it from chipping. Um, also just has a nice soft look to it. So uh, this would be our next step. So we're going to take this uh, edging tool. Okay. Um, this has a 3 8 inch radius. And we're going to insert this down into the slab. And we're going to find the edge of our form. And then we're going to use this as our guide. So at this point, we just lift up slightly on the front of the edger and just take short motions back and forth. Now we've reached that point in the pour where the clock is really starting to tick, haven't we? Right. This is one of the more challenging things to do. You're, you're kind of dealing with uh, pieces of aggregate that are at the edge. 
you might come across a piece of aggregate that wants to pop up through the surface. And you can see that there may be some imperfections created here where there's a little piece of rock that chipped out. So one of the tricks is, is to take the, uh, the edger and just grab a little bit of this paste that's at the surface and you coat the edge of the, um, the radius with it and then you can just fill that right in. So once you get into a rhythm of doing this, it goes pretty quickly. Edging is typically a two to three step process. So this first step, we've um, created the actual radius. Um, we've got the concrete now um, separated from the form. Um, the concrete's still just a little bit soft. So um, what we're gonna do now is take our magnesium floats and we're gonna go around and we're gonna take out the lines created by the edger, um, get this back in nice shape, and then we'll do one more pass over with the, uh, the edging tools. You're not trying to work it too hard. Any pitfalls you need to be aware of here? The things that common mistakes people make at this point? Um, trying to be too perfect. Uh -huh. um, really, it's just all about taking the line out, um, not trying to make the concrete super flat at this point. We're just trying to even out any of the, uh, the lines in the surface. Mm -hmm. So on this second pass with the edgers, you can see all we're doing is just really finessing the shape. Um, we're not pressing down hardly at all. We're just letting the tool do the work and just to create a nice continuous radius. So you always want to work your way to the corner with the back of the edger up. And then when you move forward, ever so slightly press it down. This can be another stumbling block for people. If they push too, too hard down on the edger, they'll dip this corner. So we're down to the final steps, and you can see that we have a really nice smooth surface. Um, if we really want to do a sweet job here, we're going to just take out some of these faint lines that were created from our magnesium floats uh, in preparation for the final brooming. The whole idea here is that the more uniform and consistent that this surface is before we broom it, the more consistent the broom finish will be. Okay, so you're basically just trying to take out imperfections, you're not trying to change the character of the finish at all? That's correct. For a, a slab like this, which would be an exterior application, we're only using these tools for just a final finesse. Um, we're not going to try to work the surface real hard and make this dense. We're just, right. again, um, just tweaking it. Which, if you were doing a garage or something, you, you would probably then wait a little longer and, and really, really work it, as you say. Yeah, we would need to uh, let this sit at least for another hour, and then we would get out there and actually start using these off of knee boards. Um, to really get a dense surface. Okay. So now we're going to basically have two tools in our hand. One tool can either be a steel trowel or a magnesium float, and that's going to be our leaner so we can get out over the, the middle of the slab. So you're going to set that down, and then you're going to have your finishing tool. And we typically like to start in the corners, um, and again, not put too much pressure on this edge, and just come through and lightly take out the imperfections. Again, the goal is not perfection here, right? Pretty, is, pretty close to perfection, pretty close? but uh, it's not a finished floor, so we're just, again, trying to just lightly flatten out any of the streaks from the trolls. Now, if we left this unfinished and this, this was it, you'd have just like a regular concrete sidewalk kind of finish? Yeah, most concrete sidewalks would still have some sort of a broom finish, a broom finish. so this might be a finish that you'd have for a, a pole, pole barn or a shed. Okay. Uh, something that's just basically flat and somewhat smooth. All right, so our next step here is to create our control joint. Um, the purpose of this is to create a uh, perforation in the aggregate of the concrete and create a perforation where, um, as the concrete shrinks, it will crack where we want it to. Typically, you're going to do this to create square sections in your slab that are no bigger than approximately 10 feet by 10 feet. Running this groover against a straight edge ensures that your joint will be nice and straight. And you can see that Ryan is doing a rocking motion back and forth um, so he doesn't gouge into the concrete um, and create any unnecessary low spots. So for a slab of this size, uh, we wouldn't normally bother with this process. Uh, this is a small enough configuration where we wouldn't expect it to crack. Uh, but again, if this was a larger, you know, 20 by 20 slab, we would want to make sure that we at least cut it in the center both directions.
Concrete finishes, once they're trowelled, are, are beautiful to look at, but they're not always that great to walk on. They can be pretty slippery. So oftentimes with a sidewalk or a, a driveway, you, you do some kind of a finish to make it a little more footworthy. Um, today we're going to show you how to broom it. That's, that's a, one good way to do it. Why don't you explain a little bit what that's all about. Certainly for any public right-of-way, you have to create a non-slip surface, mm -hmm. and the most traditional and easiest uh, non-slip surface to create is a broom finish. Uh, it's a simple method by taking a concrete finishing broom or any type of a uh, bristled uh, apparatus that you might have around the house mm -hmm. and just lightly dragging it over the surface. And again, you would typically, if it's a driveway, um, you would be brooming um, perpendicular to the traffic. So if you're coming in from this direction and driving up, okay. you would want to broom the surface perpendicular to that. Is that for traction or for drainage? Uh, it's mostly for traction. Other than changing the texture, does the brooming have any effect on the, the concrete surface? Does it make it take water more or, or drain better or worse? Well, for a, for a good durable uh, pavement outside, um, there's a fine line between creating something that's impervious, which would be a fairly tight, dense surface, uh, and something that still has a non-slip uh, surface on it. Mm -hmm. So we're going to uh, broom this with the idea that it's breaking up this plane. Um, in theory, that concrete is slightly more porous than an interior application. We're going to compensate for that by putting a good sealer over the surface after this concrete okay. is cured. This is a pretty simple process. What we're going to try to do is just gently set the broom down right on the edge of the slab and then keeping the same angle and the same pressure on the broom, lightly drag it over the surface. So the bristle's pretty much perpendicular, as close to perpendicular as you can get. That's correct. Okay. So you want to keep it square with your form. Nice and slow. Mm -hmm. And no wiggling. Right. Great. Looks great. So another way of doing this brooming process, if you want to try to create something that's a little bit more aggressive, mm -hmm. say for example you've got a driveway with a fairly steep slope and you're concerned sure. about traction, is to set the broom down closest to you, push it across the surface, and then pull it back. And by doing that you're going to create just a little bit more texture. Without dislodging too much material? Right. Then you just release at the end. We'll set the broom back down. Oh yeah. And you can see here now that we've got a bit more texture going on. Definitely do. Right. So a couple of different options you can create with just one simple tool. Very simple tool. It looks great. Stamping concrete is very popular, increasingly popular DIY finish for a, a, a otherwise drab concrete surface. And uh, we're going to take a look at a couple of different stamps today and, and uh, Chris is going to show us the basics of, of how to take simple gray concrete and make it look textural and nice. There's becoming more and more places that you can get these types of uh, colors and stamps. Um, some of the rental centers now are actually carrying them and again specialty contractor supply centers will also rent these tools. Uh, so what we've done with this slab is um, we've broadcast some different colors over the surface. These are uh, raw pigments. Um, they're worked in and they actually okay. become part of the concrete slab. And it's concrete pigment formulated for concrete. Right, these are specific for coloring concrete. And generally we'll um, blend two different colors, a lighter and darker color. Um, mm -hmm. And our goal is to kind of create a more stone-like movement um, that you might see in, in a natural uh, piece of stone. So this method is something that more of a professional would do, uh, broadcasting these pigments into the concrete. If uh, you're interested in doing it yourself, actually most of the mm -hmm. larger concrete companies now have uh, integral colors um, that are blended right. right into the concrete at the plant. So it's as easy as picking up the phone and uh, asking what color palette they have and picking your color and then the concrete is delivered in that tone. Although it does add significantly to the cost. Yes, typically you're going to be adding about 30 to 40 percent on top of the right. cost of the concrete. Right. So this area of the slab now is ready to create um, a pattern or a texture. More and more we're seeing people gravitate towards these uh, seamless stone textures. Uh, what's nice about this tool is that it, um, it doesn't have anything you have to line up. Um, you lay the mats down, they can go in any direction, they can overlap. Um, you can see the edges are slightly frayed so you'll never see a line from these tools. Uh, and that just creates um, one of several different types of um, stone patterns. There's granite, limestone, travertine, sandstone. Mm -hmm. um, this is one of our more popular textures. Okay. A slightly more advanced uh, technique would be to actually stamp a pattern into the slab. Uh, the stamp that I'm holding here is a very traditional ashlar slate pattern. So with this tool it's very important to understand the process of how these get laid down. Um, they have to line up. You can see that there's a notch here um, that the next stamp will 
connect with okay. and you just work your way across the slab. Here again, there's a much smaller window of time to work with a tool like this and there's a lot more detail work involved in making sure that all of these joints look natural and uniform. So normally then you press the stamp into the concrete and do you use a tool to set it or how do you make sure that the pattern gets imprinted? Uh, the pattern actually is imprinted by the weight of the technician working with the tool. Okay. So on our crews we have guys that range from 150 up to 220 pounds. So if the concrete's getting a little bit harder, um, you can send some of your bigger guys out and they can get a deeper impression in the slab. And this one goes on somewhat differently? Yeah, that one goes down uh, just simply by laying it over the surface. Um, again, there's a series of stamps. Um, you'll lay down, you'll imprint the texture, um, you'll take your next stamp, you'll overlay it slightly. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to spray a liquid release agent on the concrete. Okay. This is this is the, the same stuff you would put on the forms? Uh, it could be very similar, yep. So we'll generally spray a generous amount on the slab and then we'll also spray just a small amount on the stamping tool that we're using. Sounds like an important step. Without this, you'd make a big mess. Yeah. So the next step is to take this tool and lay it down over the portion of the slab that we're going to stamp. And obviously this isn't big enough to cover the whole area, so we're going to show you how we put the stamp down, create the texture, pull it up, and then move it to okay. another spot. So generally what there's, there's handles that you hold on to, and what you want to do is kind of curl the stamp, start at an edge, try to get it so it's just lined up with the edge of your other surface. and then just gently lay the slab down, or the stamp down. Now this concrete's a little bit soft. If it's really hard, you'd be out there and you'd be actually using another tool called a Womper, mm -hmm. industry term, which is basically a tamper. Mm -hmm. And you'd be out on the surface. And the idea is that every square inch of this stamp gets imprinted in the concrete. So this gives you a nice two square foot footprint sure. to create that. But you wouldn't want to go and use an actual metal or landscaping tamp on that, would you? Yeah, that's a smaller footprint and it's probably going to leave the outline of that tool on the concrete. So again, we're just going to tamp. And then I'll slowly lift this up and you should see a nice pattern underneath it. So now that we've picked the stamp up and we're going to stamp the rest of the slab, one of the most important rules is to not lay it down exactly the same way that we originally did it. You'll start to see um, what appears to be just a repetition of the mm -hmm. same texture. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this, the stamp over and I'm going to overlap, which is fine. And now I'll go through the same process. So you can see there's really not much to this and mm -hmm. when you get into a rhythm it can go pretty quickly. And now I'm just going to create uh, some texture on this edge and then we'll be done. Looks very believable. And there are other, you said there are other types of textures that right. you can do Right, this as well. is one of probably 12 that are out on the market. And which one is this again? This is the Belgian Slate. And if you don't have one of these uh, Wampers, you can also just do a little river dance out here. Very good. And then that's, that's the extent of the process, right? Once it dries, it's done. This is the finished process. What will happen overnight is this uh, release agent will dissipate from the surface. And uh, the surface will pe appear quite a bit lighter almost as though the color is fading. Um, after it's been um, set overnight, we'll come back and actually put one coat of sealer on it. Okay. And then a week later, we'll put a second coat on and that'll bring the surface back to almost this exact same look. Okay, and in the meantime, you don't need to cover it to protect it or anything, just let it dry in the open air. Right, in fact, if you cover it, you'll open yourself up to the possibility of discoloration. All right, well, our demonstration project's been sitting up overnight and uh, I think we're ready to take the forms off, is that right? Yeah, so our next okay. step is going to be to strip the forms off, clean up the edges, and then we're going to go ahead and spray on a sealer. Okay, great. And overnight is then long enough period of time for the forms? 
Yeah, typically overnight is going to give you plenty of set characteristic and strength that you can carefully take the forms off. Okay, are there cases where you might want to leave them on longer, like with a wall or anything? Yeah, anything that's vertical where there's a lot of head pressure on the concrete, you'd probably want to set at least 24 hours, if not longer. Cooler conditions also, it's not a bad idea to leave the forms on to help insulate the concrete um, so the edges don't get too cold and potentially freeze. Okay, great. I noticed too that you didn't put any kind of plastic or any kind of uh, curing agent on while, while it dried. Is that normal? With cooler conditions, uh, not a lot of direct sunlight or wind. Um, 50 to 70 degrees is actually a really great condition for this concrete just to cure naturally. If you're working in conditions that are extremely hot and windy, it's probably a good idea to cover that with poly. That's going to prevent the surface from drying out too rapidly and, and creating a, a, a weak layer of cement on the top of the concrete. So we've got the screws and the stakes out uh, from the side of the form, so now we're ready to actually pull the forms off. Um, this is where you want to be just a little bit careful. Uh, to make sure that you're not actually going in and prying against the concrete. That could uh, certainly chip the edge. So generally what we like to do is just take a, a hammer or a pry bar and just tap on the forms and just get them loosened up. Then we can pry against this form. This is the moment of truth, right? You can see we have a nice consolidated edge here. Uh, there may be a few little burrs of concrete along the edge that you can just rub off by hand. You'll typically be backfilling up against here with landscape material, grass, sod, and that'll come up just below the edge of this radius, so this material is generally never exposed. Okay, so now that the forms are off, we, we need to wash them before we seal it. Is that not what you normally do? Depends on whether the slab has actually uh, gotten dirty. Um, on some of the stamp concrete, we like to pressure wash this to remove some of the, the release agent that might, might still be on the surface. Um, with the broom concrete, you can even just take a blower and blow the surface off if it hasn't gotten dirty from uh, people walking on it. Otherwise, uh, a light duty pressure washer is the best method to kind of get it clean. Um, if you do that, you just need to make sure that that slab completely dries out before you put the sealer on. All right, and the sealer we'll be putting on today is a, a commercial product or is it something that a homeowner might find? We're going to be using a solvent-based sealer. Okay. Um, there are other options out there, water-based sealers that are available at the, the building centers. Um, you have the option of either spraying this material on or rolling it on. So what we're going to do today is actually spray it on and then back roll it. Okay, and uh, you said you have about a one to seven day window for, for applying that product? Right, again, depending on your conditions, if it's been fairly cool and damp, you may want to err on the side of seven days. Um, okay. If we have nice conditions where things are curing out quite rapidly, um, you can go ahead and put that sealer on within the, net, the first couple days. Okay, and that's a one-time product, or do you have to refresh it then uh, a couple years down the road? Typically, we want this concrete to be durable through the first winter, through the first series of freeze-thaw. Um, that's where this topical sealer will have the best benefit. Um, if you're looking at it from an aesthetic standpoint, uh, some people like to refresh that coat of sealer every year to make the concrete look nice and shiny. Like you would with the deck. Exactly. Okay. So today we've seen some of the more utilitarian ways you can put concrete to use as an outdoor building product. And one of Chris's specialties here is to use it as an indoor building product. And he's a great creative thinker and he's got a beautiful showroom here with some uh, great examples of the decorative side of concrete. We created the showroom uh, with the sole purpose of giving people a really a first-hand look at the material. And it's quite funny when uh, a husband and wife will come in. Uh, the husband will generally have his arms folded and uh, uh, be a little bit skeptical about looking at this cold gray utilitarian concrete and uh, generally the wife has done the research and so when uh, both people come in they get very excited to see just how warm and inviting the material is. Uh, our business is really involved into uh, doing countertops, doing sinks, shower surrounds, fireplaces, vertical applications. We've even done some pretty mammoth sculptures and it's really a uh, uh, a business all about finding people's creative tastes and uh, creating a beautiful concrete expression from that. All right, so concrete countertops are a very popular project these days. A lot of homeowners are trying them, some with great success, some not so much. Um, looks like you've done a beautiful job here. You've got your built-in uh, dish rack. You've got a beautiful uh, polish on it. Were there any particular difficult challenges with this concrete countertop? Is this something a homeowner could do themselves? Well, the most important thing is just understanding the basics of how these tops are formed. Um, this is called a reverse cast, so it's mm -hmm. a lot like uh, baking an upside down cake. We build a, a, a mold out of uh, malamine, okay. which you can get at any uh, building center. And we actually pour our material into the mold with the idea that the next day we flip it over, 
pull that mold off and this is the smooth surface that was created by that okay. melamine form. Great. And so you always cast your concretes in place and then put them on the cabinet um, once, once they're ready, is that right? Um, about 30 or 40 percent of our tops we actually pour right in place. Um, some of our clients really like the idea of having one big seamless piece of concrete and due to the weight and just the configuration of something mm -hmm. that large, the only way it can be really done is to actually build a, a form and pour it right on top of the, of the cabinets. Okay, but it probably if you're a homeowner working on your own kitchen, you probably want to set up some saw horses in the garage, cast it there, get it just right, and then move it to the kitchen. Absolutely, at that point it's just like bringing any other solid surface in. Um, it's a completed product and you're just gonna set it and glue it on top of your cabinets. Okay, are there any special things that someone would need to know? I know they have special concrete mixes for con countertops, is that right? Yeah, do a little bit of research and find mm -hmm. out um, exact mixes that are available locally that are specific for concrete countertops. Um, there's little tricks in the forming. Um, you can polish and seal. Most importantly, you want to make sure that it's a surface that's going to resist stains in your kitchen. So um, there's a lot of homework to do to get a good countertop, but there's a lot of resources out there to help. Well, another great way that concrete can be put to very creative use is through home furnishings. And there are a number of uh, benches and, and as you can see, a drink trough and some other great creative products you can do that way, usually with some kind of a, a, a base that might be made out of metal or wood and then a, a cast top. Can you tell us a little bit about what this furnishing is and some of the other ways that home furnishing uh, can be made using concrete? Yeah, this is a custom piece. Um, this isn't something that you can just go find in a store anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, our design philosophy, we really like to combine different materials, um, combining metals and wood with the concrete. Um, you can see here that we've actually created a glass bottom in this trough. There's mm -hmm. a drain at one end. Um, everything slopes to that drain. So this can be filled up with ice. You can have kids parties with juice boxes and sodas or obviously for adult drinks as well. And it's just mm -hmm. a really a fun conversation piece. Um, this is all about people that really want to have a unique piece of art that's functional. Right. Well, similar to countertops, uh, as far as concrete projects, our sinks now, our integral kitchen sinks, are becoming more, a more popular option. And that's been expanded now beyond the kitchen into the bathroom. It has to have countertops. This is a fairly contemporary looking prep sink that is, I presume, for a bathroom use? Yeah, that's correct. And, and what you'll find with concrete is that it has a lot of different personalities. So mm -hmm. um, some people might really see it as a contemporary material, but we've also done some interpretations that really warm it up and can work in a log home or an arts and crafts style mm -hmm. home. Sure. This particular sink is our ramp sink. Um, and really for people that maybe are trying to debate about, you know, should I get a piece of art and a sink for my bathroom? We talk them into just getting one of these and leaving it at that. It's a beautiful sculptural piece. It's definitely unique and it makes quite a statement. These sinks are really an inspiration from limestone. So they have a much more geometric shape, perhaps a little bit more of a contemporary look. Uh, they're sitting on a nice floor floating concrete slab that actually transcends into a shower base. Um, use it as a little uh, ledge for your shampoo and soap. So uh, we like to incorporate uh, these materials structurally. Um, you can see that we actually have a wall here. So is this cast in place too then? Yeah, you know, it looks like it is, but it's actually just a dura rock that's been skim coated with a right? cement uh, overlay material. Huh, plain old cement board, how about that? Yeah, it really gives the look of a cast concrete wall. Beautiful. This is just a little uh, mock-up design that we um, did here for our showroom to uh, emulate a, a shower surround. And you know, hear a lot of people complain about, boy, I hate cleaning all the grout and the, mm -hmm. the, the tile in my shower. So we're actually able to cast some, some very thin walls of concrete. Uh, these are just about an inch thick. Um, we've actually incorporated some interesting glass tile as part of the design. And this base actually slopes to a concealed drain that has okay. some decorative rock over it. So. Uh, again, these are for people that really want something unique that they haven't uh, found in, in other stone or natural tiles. Great. And it really does point out the extent to which concrete works beautifully with other building materials like glass tile or any kind of tile for that matter. Yeah, we really believe that it should be integrated with other materials and it just makes them play off each other and really looks nice. Very nice. All right. So concrete makes beautiful countertops, but it, boy, also makes beautiful floors. That's pretty obvious looking right down at our feet. Can you tell me a little bit about what you've got going on here? Yeah, this is actually a flooring that's called a micro topping and it's a very, very thin 16th of an inch layer of a cement based material applied directly over the concrete. Mm. And the reason we did that is we wanted to create a very nice fresh layer on top of this concrete that was a couple years old. From there we actually created this grid and then we hand applied um, some acid based stains um, to create this interesting patina and marbled effect. Throw a two part epoxy over the top of it which is water based. Right polish it out and you've got a beautiful floor. Um, for do-it-yourselfers, you know, this is certainly something that you'd have to play around a little bit with and get mm -hmm. comfortable with the material. Otherwise, there's other materials out there that you can um, spray on the floor to create a color.
Right. There are also some commercial or some uh, resurfacing agents that some of the building centers sell. Are those useful for floors in an interior situation too? Depending on the look that you want, a lot of those are going to create a little bit more of a rough surface that would be desirable outside, but if you want a little bit of texture in your floor, those will work as well. Well, this has been really informative, Chris. I appreciate all the time you spent with us here today in your showroom and, and teaching us a little bit about how concrete works. It's beautiful stuff. It's been great. Thank you. Well, it's been fun working with you. Now, that slab downstairs, did you want that in your car uh, or on the roof? Will it fit in my trunk? Okay. We'll make it work. Okay, sounds great. All right.